COPD is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, yet treatment options remain limited. Bronchodilators and corticosteroids manage symptoms, but they have little impact on disease progression and do not hold disease-modifying potential. Now, last year, we highlighted how dupilumab could be used as a novel and promising treatment option in a subtype of severe COPD. And one year later, we're eager to know where we stand. This is Euphoria News. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News, I'm Dr David Bull. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is the third leading cause of death worldwide, causing 3.2 million deaths in 2019. That's approximately 5% of all global deaths. A new front has opened up in the treatment of COPD as dupilumab, a monoclonal antibody against the interleukin-4 receptor, was the first biologic therapy shown to be effective in a subgroup of patients with COPD. Leading pulmonologists published a report in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2023 showing dupilumab being effective in a subgroup of COPD patients. Whilst in the meantime, interest has also grown into more and better treatment options for COPD. And today we shed light on where we stand with the novel options of care for severe COPD. Well, here to tell us more is Professor Klaus Raab. He's Professor of Pulmonary Medicine at the University of Kiel. He's also Director of Lung Clinic in Grosshansdorf in Schleswig-Holstein in Germany. He's also one of the world experts in COPD. Really good to talk to you once again, Professor. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, in my introduction, I referred to your study on dupilumab in COPD, which you published in 2023 in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I suppose the question that I need to start with is, where do we stand today with regards to dupilumab and its indications in COPD? David, thank you very much for having me again, and thanks for the opportunity to say something about the study that was, in fact, published in 23. And there was, in fact, a parallel trial that was published this year in 24. And where are we standing? Where it led to a registration of the drug dupilumab for the treatment of COPD. There's a label now. It is available as a drug, which is very rewarding also for the researchers like me um, to treat COPD. But we will probably will we have a chance to talk a little bit about the details for which patients with COPD this is most suitable for. So, so just in terms of that, dupilumab, I'm reading these studies, I've got them both here actually, the one that was published in 2023 and this one which was published in 2024. J just talk us through what they showed because according to the conclusions here, essentially dupilumab had a significant clinical response for those patients. Yes, David, that is true. And the reason why there was such a fast registration of the drug, I think one of the reasons was that both these trials were incredibly similar in their outcomes. So what was studied in the trials? It was studied that people that had the diagnosis of COPD, that were treated with standard treatment, which we call triple therapy of two bronchodilators and an inhaled corticosteroids, almost everybody had that, these individuals were treated with dupilumab or in a placebo group with their standard of care. And the patients were having the history of COPD for at least more than one year. They had been treated, as I said. They had a mean of 40 pack years, so to say. So they were heavy smokers, but they had signs of chronic bronchitis and they had signs that they were instable with the disease. That is, that they have so-called exacerbations in the preceding year before they were entered in the trial. And finally, they had to have 300 cells of inflammatory nature, so-called eosinophils, 300 cells per microliter, which is slightly elevated compared to the normal. These were the inclusion criteria of the patients, and they were treated over one year. So, so just in terms of the patients and being treated with dupilumab, what benefit did the dupilumab bring to those patients? All right. So the trials were trying to be 
inclusive, very inclusive. So as I said, the people had, the patients had a history of exacerbations. So this was one endpoint. Do you, in the arm of patients that receive dupilumab versus standard care, do you reduce these exacerbations? Secondly, do you improve lung function? Because the volume that you have sort of to breathe is something that is very important for these people. And they had impaired lung function when they entered the trial. And thirdly, does the question, do they improve symptomatically? There are standard ways of assessing this, whether quality of life parameters, health-related quality of life parameters would improve in these uh, individuals. So exacerbations, lung functions, and symptoms. On all three of these accounts, people had significant changes in the benefit of people that were treated with dupilumab. I mean, that's extraordinary that dupilumab had such a, a positive response in those patients. Now, just moving on to other biologics, I know other biologics are currently under investigation, such as mepolizumab, also benralizumab. Where are we with those? My understanding being those are sort of, um, in terms of the trials, rather less convincing. And there, there are two things in this, in, this, in this respect. First of all, trying to develop the proper patient population for the use of biologics has been going on for some years. And I think we've learned. We've learned that probably chronic bronchitis is a characteristic that responds to um, dupilumab and other biologics better than not being having a bronchitis. People that are having exacerbations, eosinophilia, and so on. So we know more about the target population, which is not everyone with COPD, I have to say that. It is true that there were several trials that had mixed results and some of the uh, uh, trials that were outright negative or were not continued. But I can tell you that with the new data that we have from the pillar map and the ongoing search for novel targets at this disease, there is now a development of several drugs that will come to a place. We will read and do see data in 24 still and in 25 of new trials if in subpopulations of COPD. And my prediction would be that there will be, next to dupilumab, which is registered now, there will be other biologics that will find a place in the treatment of COPD as well. Some of them with the same patient population as in the dupilumab trials, some of them probably in a slightly different segment of the patients, which to me as a treating physician would just be most welcome. I think it's also, I mean, it's very exciting. I think it's also worth you just reminding people those drugs work on different interleukin pathways, don't they? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right, David. There, there was a traditional way when we used drugs to bronchodilate, and there were several principles of anti-inflammatory drugs, namely in had corticosteroids. And the question was, you know, where do they fit? And we introduced some years ago already types of inflammation, eosinophilia, as one criterion uh, for the use of steroids in, in, this, in, the, in the treatment algorithm. But we were somehow stuck with, with, with the novel treatments. We are now addressing very specific pathways and interleukins, as you said. In the case of dupilumab, it would be IL-4 and IL-13. In the case of the mentioned mepolizumab, it would be IL-5. And there's a whole new class of, of molecules called alarmins, IL-33 and T-slip as an example, where we also have drugs that will address this and we will see the data of this. I, I, can't, I absolutely can imagine how that feels. What about biomarkers, though? You talked about eosinophilia. Are there other biomarkers that can predict treatment response to biologics? Very important question, because when you try to address a certain pathway, you need to know which patient would fit what drug. I mean, that's the, the background of this question. And there are limited biomarkers that have that we have available. One of them is the eosinophils that is measured in peripheral blood, easy enough. There is something to be said about IgE levels in peripheral blood that not necessarily are a reflection of allergy only. They are referring to a certain type of inflammation that may come in useful. 
There is thirdly, even for COPD, exhaled NO, measures of so-called type 2 inflammation. And there is now the development of biomarkers of the targets itself. For example, if you try to address a cytokine such as R33, there's ways to measure this in the lung or in sputum or in blood, preferably to actually find out whether the target is available in the patient. So with other words, yes, biomarkers are extremely important. Secondly, not enough yet to differentiate patients sufficiently. Good news, three years, a huge area of research and development that we will see in the next years to come to fruition. Let me uh, ask you to look in your crystal ball now, if, if you can. How do you foresee the treatment of COPD in the upcoming years? And also, surely we should treat people earlier in the disease and actually focus far more on prevention in the first place? Well, David, to pick up the, the last argument and point first, obviously um, we need to be getting better in prevention of COPD being such a huge burden and affecting so many people and in, in involving so many people with a very bad outcome, including death. I mean, that is that is a given. The second part on the biologics in the glass bowl, um, I need to remind probably everybody on this program, these drugs are given by injection. So they act systemically. They are not inhaled drugs so much. So the, the likelihood that you will address a, a, an inflammatory pathway throughout the body uh, with multimorbidities of COPD so relevant is actually very high. So basically, we would be seeing, and I would predict that we would see more and more targeted treatment for COPD in the future to come. Secondly, I think I would foresee that we will be starting earlier and earlier in the disease algorithm because once the damage is done and you get a diagnosis or the treatment at the age of 60 plus, like in the studies, by the way, it is likely that the window of opportunity may be even bigger when you start earlier. For that, you need screening programs. You need the respective biomarkers and you need the guts to actually do that. And I would be in support of exactly going that way. I mean, there still is uh, a question over health economics here because of course you've got very expensive treatments like a biologic and of course a far cheaper solution to say stop smoking in the first place. I think that's a very, very relevant point. And um, it needs to go without saying that smoking cessation programs, preventive measures not to get to that state is the key to understand the inf to how to influence the CPD. Secondly, you talked about early intervention. This needs to be a really an early intervention because it needs to be in children and in the school systems to actually sort of ban smoking from these. And we should not be so naive to believe that we have something now with relevant clinical benefit at the end of a manifest disease that we get lazy in the beginning. That cannot be the solution. What I'm saying at present, however, is for those individuals that do have the disease, that do have a high chance of a very bad outcome, we now have different opportunities to interfere, and we will have to learn how to interfere earlier for these individuals. The drugs need to be available. I'm completely with you. We need to be, however, sure that reduction of exacerbation is also a health economic argument that people have been using, and I think quite rightly so. And once we could show that you significantly reduce, for example, endpoints such as mortality, the equation gets very different. But the accessibility of healthcare systems and understanding and developing a scheme for early interventions, that is key. But that does not mean that other preventive measures, namely smoking cessation, should be out of the picture. Even more so, they should be more into the picture because we understand that you can influence the disease significantly and clinically in a relevant fashion. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Rabe. Thank you very much for having me and um, goodbye. Well, extraordinary stuff. The great news being that the treatments for COPD are continually evolving, reducing exacerbations and, of course, improving patient care.
Well, that's it for this show. You can find more information about Euphoria on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media, on YouTube, X, LinkedIn, Spotify, Instagram, and Facebook. We are everywhere. Until next time, goodbye.